We have a, a quick gallop here uh, into the talk so that we can get as much time as possible with our featured speaker. I have the privilege today to introduce Jean-Michel Cousteau. He's the chair of the board and president of Ocean Futures Society. You probably know him as an explorer, environmentalist, educator, and filmmaker. He's the son of ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, and he's investigated the world's oceans for most of his life, all of his life. He founded Ocean Future Society in 1999. This is a nonprofit organization that serves as the voice for the ocean. He was honored with the highest French civilian order of distinction, Knight of the Legion of Honor from the President of France in May 2016. He's produced over 80 films. He's a syndicated, syndicated columnist for the Los Angeles Times, where his articles appear in uh, newspapers worldwide. And he's a dedicated advocate for the protection of the water planet. I could go on and on and on about all of the honors and awards he has received, and I will cut it short there. But I'm going to leave you with a poem as we start into his talk. And this is an excerpt from Humpbacks by Mary Oliver. Three of them rise to the surface near the bow of the boat, then dive deeply. Their huge scarred flukes tip to the air. We wait, not knowing, just where it will happen. Suddenly, they smash through the surface. Someone begins shouting for joy, and you realize it's yourself as they surge upward, and you see for the first time how huge they are as they breach and dive and breach again through the shining blue flowers of the split water and you see them for some unbelievable part of a moment against the sky like nothing you've ever imagined like the myth of the fifth morning galloping out of darkness pouring heavenward spinning and with that let's welcome our special guest Jean-Michel Cousteau Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. I hope that uh, my uh, thing works. Does it work? You happy? OK. <laughs> it's been a privilege for me, and I want to thank Don Bauer, who is the one who made that happen and has helped Ocean Futures as an attorney for many years. And I'm very grateful that we were able to uh, make sure that I could come here. I am uh, totally dedicated to uh, discovering, understanding, and sharing the information that I can find with my colleagues. Uh, I've worked with many scientists and colleagues for decades. And uh, we bring it back up to the surface uh, one way or the other, and we want to share it with particularly the decision makers of tomorrow. Our young people are very critical because they are making much, much better decisions than we were making when we were kids or young. And uh, thanks to what I call the communication revolution, uh, we are now connected with every human being on the planet. For me, uh, borders is becoming a thing of the past. And uh, we can communicate and making sure that we take care of our life support system, which happens to be water. And water, whether it's fresh water or salt water, it's the same water. When you drink a glass of water, you're drinking the ocean. When you go skiing, you're skiing on the ocean. And it all goes into the ocean, evaporates, and creates that water which we all depend upon, not just us as a species, but any plants, any animals. So we need to take care of our life support system. And that happens to be the ocean, which we know very little about. We've only started to explore. We only started to discover species. And we may have explored less than 10%. I'll say maybe 5 to 8%. There are thousands and thousands of species that have yet to be discovered. And I'm like a kid because I want to see them. And I'm happy to tell you that after diving, dive, dive, since my brother, my father, 
pushed me overboard with my brother. My mother was tanked on my back when I was seven, and I've never stopped diving, never will, because <coughs> I feel that every time I go in the ocean, I learn something. When people ask me, what's your best dive, I always say the next one. And because I see things I've never seen before. And after diving, I was able to go in submarines and on and on. And very recently, thanks to an amazing gentleman who is a, one of the most creative person on the planet, I was able to become certified uh, with a new piece of equipment, which is called the exosuit. The exosuit is made in Vancouver. And Phil Newton is the inventor. And he's the one who invited me because you know, we're not for profit, so I can't afford. But he had a big company being trained, training 10 people to become uh, able to use the exosuit. So he said, oh, hey. So I joined these 10 people for free. And in five days, I learned to go into that amazing piece of equipment. And now I'm going to be able to go deeper and explore and stay longer and collect and film things that we've never seen, which we all depend upon, every one of us. And that exosuit is like an armor, but you're totally flexible. You can do anything you want, but you're protected from the pressure. And once you're in there, you put your hand in there, and you can repeat your fingers mechanically and pick up samples if you want to but you can remove your hand and adjust the air you breathe, and you can start your high-definition definition camera that is on top of your head, the LED li lights that are on your tummy. And with my right foot, I can go forward, back, left, right. With my left foot, I can go up and down, and I can jump in the water, go down to 1,000 feet in five minutes. I can spend 10 hours down there and look and explore and film and touch and collect, and then in five minutes, I'm back up. This is where we're going to go, and that's the beginning of discovering our life support system. We all connected to it. We all depend upon it. Whether you live near the ocean or on top of a mountain makes no difference, and we need to connect that with everyone, and that's what we're doing today. And let's never forget that with all the problems that we are creating, as we add another 100 million people to the planet every year, we can stabilize our population worldwide and ultimately manage planet ocean like you manage a business and only live off the interest produced by the capital. And for every species, we need to make that happen. And we are heading in that direction. And as we, and I will turn on to some images, but as we uh, run out of things to catch on land to feed ourselves, we became farmers. And what are we farming? We're farming herbivores. We don't, we're not farming lions and jaguars to feed ourselves. They probably taste very good, but we can't afford it because they need so much meat to make a lion or a jaguar. So we cannot do that with any species. And there are exceptions, like pigs, which are omnivore. And we have an educational program where we take the kids with us. And after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, everything they leave, we give it to the pig. And the pig, yum, 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 yum. And at the end of our project, <coughs> we eat the pig. <laughs> and some of the kids became in fell in love with the pig, give it a name attached to them. So we talk about hypocrisy. When you go to a restaurant, you don't fall in love with the pig. <laughs> you want to eat it. So there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. And now we have amazingly understood that we're taking more from the ocean than the ocean can produce. And I'm not even talking about all the pollution that goes into it, not just what we see, which is our primary sense, vision, but what we don't see, chemicals, heavy metals, and so on, all that stuff is accumulating in there. And when you're on top of a mountain, and be careful, there's another dog over there. OK. And you know, uh, uh, maybe we can have them meet each other. 
It would be fun. How are you? Anyway, uh, <coughs> we have huge opportunities today. And we are connected, and I recommend you connect with the uh, University of Maryland, if you're interested, where there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Zohar, who now can show you that he can produce herbivore fish because we're taking too many of the fish from the ocean anyway. And you can literally produce this fish because, excuse me, it's not, you haven't had lunch yet, but you will soon. The fish that he's growing in his absolutely fascinating place, they poop. And these poop are growing the plants or the algae which the fish eat. And now they're going to have people investing in fish farms. And those fish farms are completely closed, and they can be where the demand is, whether it's Chicago or uh, Lyon in France or wherever. And there will be no emission of CO2 by the transportation of these fish or the last or what's left in the ocean that we catch, which are there for free. When you eat a fish, you don't pay for the fish. You fish, you pay for the, the cost of catching it, transporting it, freezing it, emission of CO2, which affects uh, our life support system. So having a fish farm, much less emission of CO2. And the prices will go way down. And when you're away from the ocean, you can go to the farm and get a fresh fish and not have to buy a frozen fish. And that will go on and on. There are many, many opportunities. We're living one of the most exciting times on the planet today. And yes, we have problems. Of course we have problems. But we need to solve them. And that's it. And we're the only species on the planet that has the privilege and the opportunity to not disappear. It's our choice. Nature doesn't care. We can disappear. And the planet will keep going on one way or the other. So it's our choice. So we're so privileged and it's so exciting and to be able to look in the eyes of kids today and say, ah, I'm doing everything I can to make sure you will have the same privilege that I've had. And I want your children or my grandson who was born underwater who throw all his toys in the pool so he can dive to get it. And that's how connected we are to our life support system. Well, I've had the privilege to, many years ago, decide, OK, my father wanted to go to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, 1,200 miles or 1,400 miles, depending on how we, you look at it, of coral reefs and islands and absolutely fascinating places. And he had never been there. I said, we're going to go there. And we found the support to make a show, which became not a one-hour special, but ultimately two-hour special because of what we found. And we were there with scientists who discovered new species. Uh, some of them I don't even know, uh, they don't even talk about, uh, because we want to protect them. They have never been found anywhere else. And uh, there are some species which are being harvested and sold in aquariums in Japan, which is a, a real problem. But uh, we were amazed by how affected these places in the middle of the Pacific, thousands of miles away from the mainland of whether it's North America or Japan or many other parts of the world, are being affected by the way we mistreat the water system. And not only with the garbage, which we're all very sensitive to, but all these chemicals and heavy metals, which are accumulating massively in our life support system. So I want to share with you that very important moment, which for me was an opportunity to never, never point a finger. I, but you know, if you point a finger, there's three fingers pointing at you. <laughs> so. Try to reach the heart. Try to sit down. Try to have a dialogue with the people 
or the decision makers, whether it's in industries and governments. Because industries and governments, they have an obligation, which is to make a profit this year, otherwise you get kicked out, or be reelected, otherwise you get kicked out. Well, they have families, they have children, they care. And so we help them make the bridge. And that was a huge opportunity, and I've done that in many parts of the world with decision makers in industries and governments, and I will never stop doing that. But in this particular case, as you will see, it was with the President of the United States then. Could we have the DVD, please? You have to push the button. You don't need to see me. Great, thank you. So here we are in some of these beautiful places in the Northwest Santa Hawaiian Islands, uh, where we saw many, many beautiful species, very healthy, uh, some of them and others that uh, are being affected that far away from the mainland. And fortunately, uh, we were able to uh, film the monk seals, for example, which is disappearing in many parts of the world, including where I grew up in the Mediterranean Sea. Very beautiful schools of sharks and this fish that uh, is collected by the Japanese uh, for the aquarium. This was a very great privilege for us to do that. And we went to Necker Island, which uh, historically, culturally, is very important for people who navigated the Pacific, but also where the monk seals go and rest. And they are protected today, but they're having huge problems. And uh, uh, we can start to see some of our debris that uh, is reaching out to all the parts of these uh, islands and reefs. And this baby there is playing and, oh, of course, he's trying to play and he's catching a piece of plastic. Fortunately, in this case, he will fall out of his mouth. But there is a female that has been operated in Honolulu with uh, seven pounds of plastic in her stomach. And walking on those islands, the lesson island in this case, you're looking at what you and I have put out there and this is what's happening in the middle of the Pacific. And uh, you have thousands of tons. And all the birds, many of them, which are coming from the Southern Pacific every other year to the same nest, are coming there. And uh, this is all our debris that we see. And they're nesting or putting their eggs everywhere, tons and tons of fishing nets and here all the debris which uh, the fine fish, are, I mean the birds, are uh, picking up on anything that floats where the flying fish are depositing their eggs and they regurgitate that in their babies to feed them. That's their job. And I found thousands of birds that never flew and have between 8 and 12 pieces of plastic in their stomach. This is what we are doing to the environment we depend upon. It can change. We can make a difference. We can educate. And uh, we can make sure this doesn't happen Those again. Those debris which uh, and I found discard, all that stuff uh, everywhere uh, is being picked up by uh, birds who uh, collect them because they are uh, eggs, fish eggs usually, that have been laid on these pieces of plastic. And the parents brings it back to the island and feed their chicks. Lighters coming from all over the world. Children toothbrush, adults, mascara. We have toys. We have soldiers. We have vials with still stuff in it. That went into a bird and back into another bird. Nature can take a lot of punishment. These creatures here are doing unbelievably well when you think what they have to put up with. And at the same time, perhaps too much is too much.
So we were able to ultimately, after visiting and reporting and filming, to uh, speak to the uh, governor of the state of Hawaii and then people in different departments about what we were able to see. And uh, we ended up in the White House where uh, the President W. Bush invited us to show the film. And that led him to, uh, with our team, to decide to protect the Northwestern Hawaiian Island, which at the time became the largest marine protected area in the United States. And I'm happy to say <coughs> that in September last year, President Obama came at a big conference we had in Hawaii, and he took a plane and went all the way uh, to see the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and declare to uh, protect what President Bush had done four times bigger than what W. Bush had done and is today the largest marine protected area in the United States and in the world. It's a great, great privilege and to see whether it's Democrat or Republican agree to protect our life support system. We are heading in that direction. We need to reach the hearts of decision makers more and better and in a nice way, not by criticizing and the defense systems in these cases kind of go down and we can have this conversation and help them make better decisions. I would like to uh, tell you about some of the consequences of what we're doing and particularly what uh, we have experienced uh, during some of our uh, expeditions uh, with the toxic flame retardant, which is one of the PBDEs, which is being used for people who uh, may fall asleep when uh, they smoke in their couch or in their bed. And the PBDEs have been put into all kinds of products, including in kids', kids clothes. Well, kids don't smoke that I know of at six months old, uh, and on and on. So we need to change that, and we were able to, after we had that experience, uh, at least in California, to have representative of the state of California, the government, and our team to be tested uh, to 32 chemicals and two heavy metals. And I'm happy to say that they've changed the laws, and it's in the process uh, even in other parts of the world. But uh, if you don't communicate with decision makers, they don't make those decisions. Could we have the next DVD, please? And of course, orcas is my favorite creature on the planet. Today we have results. I understand it was because of your concerns about the She was our medical doctor during our expedition. About what these results in humans might be, especially since we consume the same fish. And also, we're at the top of the food chain, just the same way the orcas are at the top of the food chain in the marine environment. You each have released permission that I could see the results first, so that I could go ahead and make these charts. Each graph is going to have the amount, and then each of our names are along here. Jean-Michel, Carrie, Holly, and Holly's son, Gavin, and myself, we all agreed to be tested. So our PBDEs, polybrominated diethyl ethers the so-called flame retardants, okay? Now these are also manufactured chemicals that were added to products to make them flame resistant. Electronic equipment, uh, you'll find it in home furnishings, couches. They've shown that there are high levels in dust and products have to pass a flammability standard. But obviously we're now realizing that perhaps there's a downside. What we do know is, is that children have a lot higher level of these flame retardants than moms. Uh, this is one study, fire retardants in toddlers and their mothers. And that's because where do kids spend their time? They spend on it the on ground. the floor. And in the orcas, they are seeing that this level is going up, uh, not down. How does it get into the orcas? It gets into the orcas from the environment and just passes Wash up Wash down the streams and into the, the food, food chain. chain. Yep. Let's go on to uh, the results. There I am, 
John Michelle. Carrie, we'll do you next. Okay, you look pretty good on that one. Holly. Oh. Oh. According to this, um, you're definitely higher than the 95th percentile. Um, and we might as well just forge ahead and see Gavin as well while we're here. So according to Dr. Petraeus up at Berkeley, she really thinks this relates to something in the home environment. Mm -hmm. um, she sees these kind of levels and... Now remember, Holly, these are just numbers. I know. He's testing the way we expected him to. Mm -hmm. We know that children are high. <laughs> That's shocking. That is really shocking. And for me, as a mother with a four-year-old that has high levels of these flame retardants, I want answers. We deserve answers. We are using our children as an experiment, and it's not fair. And I don't want to see those adverse health effects for my own son. And no one else should see that, too. You do not have to turn the lights on. I just want to have you relax a little bit. We're making progress. We have a lot of work to do. Time is critical. But, you know, Hollywood scared all of us when they created Jaws, which was misrepresenting one of the five or six species of sharks in the ocean out of 440 species that exist, including the biggest fish ever on the planet, the whale sharks, because Hollywood hasn't been able to spend $50 million to make a feature film on the shark that has no teeth and is going to gum you to death. <laughs> well. The great white sharks have had a very bad reputation. And we were in Africa, and I had the pleasure of learning to dive with great white sharks, thanks to a gentleman who was a spare fisherman who was making a living catching fish. And sometimes the great white sharks would show up and want to not to hit, to hurt him, but to take his fish. And he said, one day I'm going to have an accident. So he said, uh-uh, I'm done. So he said, oh. I have a fishing boat. I can invite people to come. I'm going to put them in a cage, and they can see great white sharks and see that they come. They check you. The water is clear. There's no blood in the water. Hey, I can be there. So he goes and swims with great white sharks, and people are in the cage, and they can take pictures and film and so on. And he invited us, my team and I, and said, OK, you can do it. So we went in the great watch in the uh, char in the cage, and then he said, "Hey, Cousteau, why don't you come with me and uh, I'll show you what to do? You can be with great white sharks again. If the water is clear, no blood, and I'll show you. You can dive and you grab the upper back side of the dorsal fin. There's no nerve endings there, and you can take a ride." And I said, OK, <laughs> but you don't want me to do that. And he said, come on, don't be a wee-wee. <laughs> anyway, uh, after three days, I had to do it. So we were diving all the time, and the great white sharks are there. They're not stupid. They're not interested in us. They're interested in the animals, the sea lions that are living on the island, or the birds, or whatever. And that's meow, 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 because they're doing their job. Their job is to keep the ocean clean. That's their job, and we need to preserve them. It's critical. So here we are diving with the next DVD, please. And I want to show you when we were underwater and a great white shark showed up. <laughs> African penguins live on the shores of Dyer Island off the southwestern coast of Africa and were once called jackass penguins because their vocalizations sound like a donkey's. 
One particular penguin entered the water in an area known to be home to a population of great white sharks. Great white sharks are known to devour penguins, so this little penguin better be on the lookout. But as we can see, the situation this time is completely under control of the penguin, not the shark. Because in nature, courage can come in small packages. Well, I uh, still want you to relax a little bit and remind you some very critical things. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, you love to go to the coastline somewhere and lay on the beach and, oh, God, it's so nice. And they see the waves and uh, the birds that are coming and so on. Well, we need to thank all kinds of creatures. And I, I want to see what could happen to you uh, when you have this opportunity and I'll have the next DVD, please. Wherever you go down along the coastline, uh, you can be with your family, friends, and so on, on these beautiful white sandy beaches and enjoy yourself. Here we are in Hawaii, you know, the beautiful white sandy beaches. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Well, where is that sand coming from? These are volcanic islands. Well, the coral reefs is growing on everything, and the parrotfish looks for the algae, not the reef itself, but they scrap some of it, and you know, it's calcium carbonate. They don't care about the calcium carbonate, but they care about the algae that feed them. And after, when they have too much in their tummy, well, they swim away, <laughs> and they poop all that calcium carbonate which goes down on the ocean floor and it goes there and then you have the sea cucumbers who are looking for food and I'm looking at them and they're eating all of what is coming from the parrot fish because it wasn't clean enough and what comes in the mouth is not as clean as what comes out of their butts. Next time you go on the beautiful white sandy beaches, you're laying on parrot fish poopings. This is how connected we are to nature. And we need to be very, very grateful as often as we can. So I wanted to share that with you because I thought it was very, very critical. Well, I... Uh, I'm a fanatic of orcas, which are also called killer whales. And uh, we um, have tried to do everything we can to help make better decisions about those. And I had the pleasure and the honor of being able to liberate the star of the movie, Keiko, which name, I mean, Free Willy, uh, which real name was Keiko. And it took four and a half years to get Keiko out of jail in Mexico City in high altitude, in artificial salt water, eating frozen fish, and uh, most of the time being alone and occasionally with uh, different species of dolphins. And uh, that's the only place that Hollywood was agreed to go and make the film, uh, Free Willy. And, uh, Ultimately, we uh, felt that we needed to make sure we do everything we can for Keiko, his real name, uh, to be uh, removed because he had major skin disease and, and he was in very bad shape. Well, we uh, were successful in doing this, but it took four and a half years to bring him to Oregon, two years, and then fly, thanks to the United States Air Force, on the plane, which was refilled twice as we went to Iceland, where Keiko had been caught when he was uh, a baby uh, from his mother, and uh, we introduced him over there. Could we have the next DVD, please?
This is what we can do, and it's very difficult, and we're trying to do it with many parts of the world, and there are ways now with the technology to do it very successfully and communicate. The death of the Sea World Trainer is a tragedy that we all lament and must be seen as something gone terribly wrong. I know that these trainers are dedicated to the care of these orcas and inspired by their passion for them. But this tragedy causes us to think. Maybe we, as a species, have outgrown the need to keep such wild, enormous, complex, intelligent, and free-ranging animals in captivity, where their behavior is not only unnatural, it can become pathological. Maybe we have learned all we can from keeping them captive and asking them to perform for our pleasure and profit. Now we know that they are to the ocean what we are to the land. But all of our groundbreaking insights have been learned by diligently studying them in the wild, where we discovered they have languages and relationships and complex societies just like us, like us. In captivity, orcas can't even echolocate. They live in a world of sound, and confining them between walls is like blindfolding a person, putting them in a jail, and expecting to learn something about them. We need to look at ourselves and decide the time has come to view captivity of whales and dolphins as a part of our history, not a tragic part of our future. Well, I still want you to relax a little bit because I've had some amazing experience and adventures where I was in Mexico not very long ago and uh, I love to, uh, in Baja California, I love to go and see some fish that are protecting their nest. And uh, usually it's a male. Uh, the females lay their eggs, the male fertilize them. and He's there making sure no, no other fish come to eat the eggs. So I was there. I was fascinated. And then something happened. Could we have the next DVD, please? I was there, but oh, God, what a surprise. You're going to see the fish. <laughs> so here I am. And I'm looking at that fish, and his nest is right there under the rock. And, I was, and he was protecting, was saying, Cousteau, get away. And then the sea lion showed up. And I thought it was a beautiful young female that was interested in me. <laughs> get up. And then dumped me and went to the cameraman, Jim, and fell in love with him. And kind of caressing him and so on. I was so jealous. But ultimately I found out it was a male. So I didn't care. These are some of the things that happen, you never plan it. And that's why when people ask me what's your best dive, the next one. Well, I know we have very little time before I open it for your Q&A, but I'd like to close with uh, what for me is uh, a very magic moment, and particularly after the presentation that you experienced yesterday uh, I was able to go to Maui in Hawaii and uh, get a permit with a scientist who was studying the humpback whales, which I'm fascinated by and never, never will stop. And uh, I wanted to go and dive with them. But we divers 
like boats, like a lot of us, are making noise. And it was decided that we could not go diving with the humpback whales, which are there, coming all the way from the northern Pacific, thousand miles down south, for a mom to give birth, take care of her young, lose a third to a fourth of her body weight because she cannot be fed there until she takes the baby back all the way up to the northern part of the Pacific Ocean to be f able to feed herself to continue taking care of her baby. And males who are there, of course, having only one thing in mind, and that's to mate and uh, reproduce. And so they are there, very gentle, and they are very strict regulations. And we, s we were told, you can't dive unless you dive on a rebreather. And by diving on a rebreather, you don't make bubbles, you don't make the noise that normally may scare not just the humpback whales, but any creatures away. And uh, we were very, very privileged to be able to do that and dive with uh, three whales for an hour and 20 minutes on a, on a rebreather and then meet some other whales ultimately. And uh, that was very, very uh, emotional. And I uh, want to share that moment to close my presentation before your q and I hope you will enjoy it. Maestro, could we have the next DVD? I call it the Humpback Ballet. The baby came toward me and removed his one third of his length fins back. Do not touch. I'm sorry for the technical problems that uh, I just observed. It uh, shouldn't jump like it was jumping, but uh, I, I uh, 
I will make sure this ne never happen again, but I hope you've approved it, enjoyed it. I'm going to, uh, as I try to answer some of your questions, I'm going to pass that on, which is not far from those whales up in the Pacific Northwest, what we found in the stomach of birds. Uh, and I counted 52 different countries, including France, in there. I'm going to pass that on, and uh, please don't open it. <laughs> you can take pictures if you want to, but uh, not opening the box. And that's what we're doing to our life support system. Could you pass it on, please? So we're going to open it up to questions now. Just raise your hand if you have a question, and Courtney or I will come to you with the microphone. If uh, there are no questions, it's OK, because that means I'm perfect. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, uh, feel comfortable to ask me questions. And I know that some of you have to leave because you're starving. <laughs> or you have to go to <laughs> class. Any questions? Wow. Uh, they are uh, helping more now than they've ever done before. And uh, Japan, as you know, is a small country. They have a lot of problems uh, with the uh, uh, Fukushima. Uh, and uh, down in San Diego now, there are scientists who are catching bluefin tuna that uh, are the fastest swimming fish in the planet. They can go up to 40 miles an hour, not all the time, but when they have to. And they cross the Pacific looking for food. And uh, in, down in San Diego, the s scientific community caught a few of these uh, bluefin tuna that have the Fukushima radioactivity. Uh, so I tell people don't eat bluefin tuna, at least not in the Pacific. <laughs> mm. It's a real, real problem. And la lady, you were raising your hand. Yes, flame retardant still being used, but less and regulations needs to be imposed or adopted by every state of the union or the United States as a nation and in other countries as well. But uh, the biggest damage was in the US that I know of with the, uh, the PBDEs, not the, uh, there are many other chemicals. We counted 52 different chemicals. I was very heavy on, on uh, Mercury, and I know why. And the lady uh, who works with me now for 20 years, I'm happy to tell you that she moved away, uh, changed all the clothes of her son, uh, changed all the uh, what they use at home, and his level has gone down, and he's not normal. <laughs> he's 13 years old, and we went to celebrate his uh, certification of scuba diver when he was 10. And uh, I'm happy to say that we do everything we can to preserve our health. And that's very, very important and critical. But there are still a lot of uh, those chemicals in what we consume and what we use. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, madam. No, she, you're a lot <laughs> prettier than he is. <laughs> Um, is the expansion of the Hawaiian Reserve um, in danger of being lessened again under the current administration? Well, the current administration would like to uh, eliminate everything that Obama has done. Uh, to me, it's very sad, and uh, I know it may happen. If it happens, it will come back uh, once we change decision makers. Uh, it, it <laughs> I don't argue with uh, certain issues that are at stake, but what is positive needs to be preserved, and then let's go on to the next thing and the next thing. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, uh, what uh, President Bush and President Obama have done will be a symbol to the rest of the planet on how we need to protect and preserve our life support system. And we can do it. Yes, sir. Uh, just um, one comment and a question. 
Um, my comment is that uh, three or four years ago, um, I'm proud to say that Vermont uh, banned PBDEs, the flame retardants you're talking about, in um, upholstered furniture, which is one of the places where they were used quite commonly. Um, so there's been a movement uh, here, California, and other places away from them, but it's still an issue. Um, my question is, um, you talk about um, uh, plastic and other objects that are uh, found everywhere in the ocean. Can you talk about uh, how they get there? Are these um, being deliberately dumped? Um, are they washing down from streams? I mean, where, where's everything, where are all these objects well, coming from? Uh, yes, they're dumped. They're, most of them, anyway. There are accidents sometimes, but most of it is dumped. When you uh, be uh, on top of a mountain somewhere and you're a smoker and your uh, cigarette lighter is not working anymore, you throw it. You have the monkey reflex. Well, it goes somewhere on land. It rains. And that thing floats. So it's going to float until it makes its way into a stream. And then it's going to go all the way to the ocean. And we never pay attention to that. But I was on a cruise ship between Hawaii and Los Angeles. And I sat near a window. And I counted 32 pieces of plastic in one hour and 20 minutes. Right there, going by on one side of the boat. I don't know about the other side. So we are responsible for all this waste. Now, what we need to know is that these plastic, you know, we talk about an ocean of plastic uh, in the Pacific. That's, excuse me, BS. Uh, because the plastic decompose. And uh, you can go out there and you can sail and find one piece here, one piece there, but you don't find a big amount. But there is a big amount because the currents take it. It's three miles along, and it's going around and around and around. But it, the plastic is there and decomposed, and it goes down to the bottom of the food chain. It goes on to the uh, plants and animals, the zooplankton and phytoplankton, which, and we filmed that and so on. I mean, it's a fascinating story because this is the zooplankton and phytoplankton, but mostly the animals, uh, are making a, um, uh, how can you say, the, uh, a movement from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the surface every, every, every night. It's the biggest uh, creatures that, and the many different species, by the way, that uh, uh, moves that way. And, and we're very, very connected to it. And every other creature is going to come and feed on those and feed on those. And it goes up the food chain all the way to the fish that we catch and put in our plates with all those chemicals and heavy metals. Everything is connected. One water system, one, uh, I mean, so we need to be very, very careful. And there are huge opportunities today where we can create little tiny industries that can be positioned where there is any runoffs, whether it's a river or whether it is a very small stream. And you can put all these industries around the planet. And you're talking about the creation of millions of jobs, particularly for many people who have no work. And that would help. And if we protect our environment, we protect ourselves, and ultimately we'll be fine. So uh, we, we, it's a very, very exciting time, just like I was mentioning growing fish, uh, like we <laughs> grow chicken. <laughs> um, growing fish and, and now being able to have industries to protect our life support system. So do it. I'm sorry to say we're going to have to end on that note. I know you want to check me we're, out. We're out of time and people do need to get to classes. So let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you.